talked about um, some of the issues that Moses uh, was dealing with. And uh, today I'm going to continue in Exodus. I'm going to look at a few uh, verses from chapter 3 and a few verses from chapter 4. And um, I just want to tell everybody, those of you who have uh, been praying for me, uh, I appreciate that. I'm doing much better. Um, I had some more chest x-rays last night at the hospital after being in the hospital um, over the weekend. And so, so things are better from the previous ones to the current ones and whatever. So um, I'm not contagious. I asked the doctor that again uh, today when I saw him. So um, that's good. I'm feeling, feeling quite some better, not 100%, but uh, I'm doing better. So if you prayed for me, I appreciate it. If you thought I was going to die, well, sorry that didn't happen because God's in control and you're not. So. No. <laughs> it's okay. Everybody's going to die someday. I know we will. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that day. I'm not, I'm not in a hurry, but I'm looking forward to it. Because I know where I'm going. So um, it's going to be a glorious day. Just not in a hurry. But, uh, I'll get there someday. Anyways, my message tonight is called Excuses, Excuses. A lot of people make excuses about a lot of things. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, Moses and the excuses he made and why some of us make the excuses that we make. And so um, we'll get started with, uh, with this evening's message. Hopefully you'll be blessed um, by this word. Um, let's begin with a word of prayer and then uh, we'll uh, get into this message. Gracious Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the, the opportunity to, to, to share your word, to delineate your word. Father, I just pray that you would give each of us a, a download from heaven. You said if any man lacks wisdom, he's to act, ask of God, and um, accordingly, God will give him wisdom, uh, him or her wisdom, liberally and abundantly. So we pray that, Lord, that you would give us wisdom as we need it, that you would give us wisdom according to, uh, to what you have for each of us. So Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for harvest time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for all the things that pertain to life and godliness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Excuses, excuses. You know, sometimes when we get a mental picture of certain Bible characters in our minds, they're not quite right. Uh, once we get a particular image in our brain, sometimes it's just hard to get it out. I remember, um, I remember I visited um, a, a good friend of mine in the hospital a few years back, and um, his two young nieces were um, visiting at the same time, and um, he asked if I would pray for the uh, whole situation. He was um, dealing with a stroke and, and paralysis and really struggling and having a really difficult time. And the nurse came in and... Um, you know, um, she told the two young um, nieces of his that they probably should step out. She said because she had to take care of some things that, um, you know, probably wouldn't be appropriate for young young girls. And so um, I, uh, I told my friend, I said, uh, Jim, I think I'm going to step out as well. And um, he says, well, that's probably a good idea because... Once you see certain things, you're just not able to unsee them. And so I kind of laughed. <laughs> but the, that's the way it is with life. You know, sometimes we expose our things, ourselves to things that we just can't unsee. And such is it is the case with Moses, for example. You know, when I think of Moses, you know, I think of Charlton Heston. You know, in my mind's eye, you know, the, the Charlton Heston that's about ready to part the Red Sea um, in the movie, The Ten Commandments. It's Moses, and then it's Charlton Heston, then it's back to Moses. I mean, the picture of Charlton Heston and Moses seemingly can't be separated if you know what I'm talking about. I mean, when you think Moses, immediately you see that picture of um, Charlton Heston. And such it is with the power of the silver screen. And... Um, you know, it's kind of interesting because if you're over the age of 50, I would say, Charlton Heston is probably more Moses to you than Moses is to you. 
I mean, we read about Moses yeah. and think about Moses, but if you've seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, um, even once, yeah. I mean, forever, Charlton Heston is Moses to you, and no one else could ever be Moses besides Charlton right. Heston. But if you're younger, you've probably seen The Prince of Egypt, and Moses comes to mind as a completely different character here, and at the very least, you're not thinking at least Charlton Heston, and all is harmless enough, but sometimes our images get in the way of reality. That's one of the reasons why pornography is so dangerous. The images we have in our mind often pervert our reality and pervert things in our mind. But again, back to Moses. Moses is a good example. Uh, most of us think of Moses as a mighty hero of faith. Um, we don't think of Moses in a bad way when we think of Moses for the most part. Moses stood up to Pharaoh. Moses led the children of Israel across the Red Sea on dry ground. Moses received the Ten Commandments and spoke with God face to face. He's probably the first person in the world that ever had a tablet. Um, and those tablets contain the Ten Commandments. Imagine that. Before they even dreamed of tablets in our current state, uh, Moses had the first tablets. But all these things of Moses are true. But there's another side to Moses' story that most of us don't even think about or focus on. And if you roll the tape back to the beginning, actually, Moses was anything but a hero. I mean, we look at Moses and we ascribe to him hero uh, accolades, but Moses wasn't much of a hero at all in the beginning. When the Lord spoke at the burning bush, he told him, so now go. Simple and clear instructions. And Moses, I've got a big job for you to do. Put your sandals back on, head for Egypt. I want you to talk to Pharaoh for me on my behalf. The only problem is, Moses didn't want any part of it. Here, God himself is speaking to Moses, and Moses just makes excuses. One excuse after another. It's what a lot of people do in life in general. Instead of making progress or making good of potential, they just make excuses for lots of things, and so it was with Moses. Moses didn't want to go see Pharaoh. Moses didn't want to deal with the with the freeing the, the, the children of God from the grips of Pharaoh. And he had basically two big objections to the whole plan. First, he didn't want to tangle with Pharaoh. He had lived in Pharaoh's household. He knew the best of the best. Pharaoh was the most powerful man in the world. Moses had lived in, in Pharaoh's household, was raised in Pharaoh's household, was educated in Pharaoh's household, knew that Everything in Pharaoh's household was the best, but he decided to do what God wanted instead of what was more comfortable for him. So he left the household of, of Pharaoh. So he didn't want to go back and tangle with Pharaoh at all, didn't want to deal with him. And secondly, he didn't think that the children of Israel, the people of Israel, would even follow him. I mean, why would the children of Israel follow somebody that's been missing in action for more than 40 years? probably forgot his name for the most part. I mean, in short, Moses thought that the whole idea would be a disaster. I mean, why send me, Lord? I don't want to go back to Pharaoh, and I certainly don't think the people will even listen to me, and that maybe God should look somewhere else for a better leader. That was the thinking of Moses' mind for the most part. And that brings us to the text that I want to talk about today from Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 4. And we pick up the story actually in Exodus 3 at verse 11. But there's a takeaway for all of us. When God calls, don't make excuses. See, God calls a lot of us, but most of us, we just sit on our, you know what, butts and do nothing. We don't listen to God. Most of us, we, we get so distracted with our phones and Facebook and social media and texting and talking and life and everything else that we're wrapped up with. I find it amazing to think that um, researchers say that most people, 
you know, have about 15 to, to 16, 17 hours of screen time every day between their phone screen and their computer screen and their TV screen. Most people, they're so glued to a screen every day, they don't have time to even think for themselves. It was funny, when I was a kid, my grandfather bought us calculators. This was back in the 60s. And um, he said, these little calculators, they'll figure out everything in your brain for you and do it for you. He said, but you can have them, but you have to prove to me that you know all your multiplication tables in your brain first, how to do addition and multiplication and subtraction in, in your brain first, and then I'll give you the tool to play with that will show you how easy it is. But he said, until you develop your mind, you don't get to have the shortcut. You have to develop your mind because most people don't use their minds to think. They use their minds for stupid things. And so it is. And, you know, that stuck with me. I was probably only about seven or eight years old when he showed us these calculators. And I thought, you know, this is easy street. We don't have to learn nothing. You press a couple buttons and there's your answer. You know, nowadays you go to the store and if the, if the machine doesn't tell them how much change to give you, they have no idea. I was uh, at a store the other day and the cash register was broke. I gave the, the lady $4 for a $3.49 purchase and she says, I don't know how much change to give you back. I mean, 51 cents, it's like, duh. But, you know, that's how it is with young people. They just don't use their brains and, and have never developed the use of their brain because they can't even take $4 bills and know how to make change for three forty nine, which is pretty sad. But my point is, when God calls, don't make excuses. God calls all of us, but most of us are so distracted or um, into our own myopic uh, universe, me, myself, and I, the Holy Trinity that most of us live with, um, most of us, we don't even hear the voice of God because the voice of God is not a loud, booming voice. It's a still, small voice. So to hear the, the, to hear the voice of God, you have to turn down all the other racket, all the distractions. You got to turn off your radio. You got to spend some time, quiet time with the Lord. You'll definitely hear from him. And uh, if you don't make quiet time, then you probably won't hear from them. But most people, you know, just don't do that. But before we jump into the text, let me tell you, I have to give Moses a little bit of a break. Because you have to note that at this time, God's calling Moses back to do something large. To save the children of Israel, to save the people of Israel from Pharaoh. But Moses is now 80 years old. So he's not a kid anymore. He's not a young man anymore. Shoot, you know, I just turned 60 and I'm thinking, holy smokes, what happened? So, uh, you know, Moses has got 20 years on me at this point. You know, so we can hardly blame Moses, Moses if he felt that he was a little too old or maybe the job was too big or the job was too hard. I mean, he's 80 years old and God's telling him, you're going to save my people. And Moses is like, yeah, right. As to his two objections, both were rooted in reality. It's not as if Moses is making this up. See, Pharaoh wouldn't be glad to see Moses. And he didn't want to let the Jews go anywhere because Pharaoh had a good thing going. The Jews were enslaved by Pharaoh. So it was free labor. That's all he had to do is feed them. So who could blame Pharaoh? He's not going to let his slaves go. I mean... You know, he's getting free slave labor. And so, as for the second objection, Moses had every reason to worry about how his fellow countrymen would receive him. You know, he was a Jew, and, you know, would the other Jewish people, the other Jewish leaders, would they even receive him? After all, he had been gone for 40 years, and the last time they saw him, you know, Moses was basically a fugitive. He was running from the law. I mean... Um, that's just the reality of realities. So I'm not sure if, um, you know, any of the local judges here had any paper on them, but I know the, the judges in Egypt did. But I don't blame Moses for having doubts. He had been on the run for 40 years. There's a psychological term, a psychological term that's called imposter syndrome. I don't know if you ever heard of it before. 
It means that you secretly think that you're not qualified for a job. Imposter syndrome. And that's kind of how Moses felt here. You know, you're a faker waiting to be exposed. You're wanted by the law. I mean, you don't think that you're up to it because of your age. Your countrymen aren't going to receive you. You certainly don't want to go back to Pharaoh's house where you left on bad terms. We've all felt that way at one point or another. We just don't feel like doing something that we're told we should do. I mean, I know I should do, do this, but, uh, well, you know, that relationship's broken, or those. I left on such bad terms, I don't really want to come back. You know, I screwed that person over, so now i got to face him again. I don't want to do that. I did this, and I did that. But Moses makes five excuses to the Lord about why he isn't qualified to do God's will. See, God thinks that Moses is the perfect guy. You know, God's will is perfect. It's perfectly suited for Moses. And Moses thinks, eh, not so fast. I'll tell you all kinds of excuses of why I don't want to do what you want, want me to do, God. So see if any of these excuses sound familiar to you. Number one excuse, I'm not qualified or I'm unqualified. In Exodus 3.11, but Moses asked God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So his first, his first answer to God is, who am I? I can't do this. It's way more than me. You know, was Moses underqualified? The answer is certainly yes. From a human point of view, he's not a likely prospect to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Pharaoh. He's 80 years old. And after all, he's been gone from the palace of Pharaoh for a long time. He killed a man. He, his reputation probably wasn't the best. I mean, he left on bad terms. Murder was now part of his history. And if you were picking candidates to lead God's people out of Egypt, Moses probably wouldn't be on the top of your list if, if you were on some uh, um, job searching website. But then there's these two words, but God. You know, the words that are on my shirt tonight. I mean, that's the answer. See, God's whole reply can be summed up in five words. I will be with you. See, most of us think, or when we think we can't do something, we think, well, of course I can't do it. Of course it's not going to work for me. But then God enters the picture, but God. And in these five little words, God's telling Moses... You don't have to do it. I will be with you. See, most of us, we don't live close enough to God to know that God is with us. You know, we worry, we fret, we fear. I can't do this. What do you mean? I? Well, when God says do it, you can do it. And when God says I'll be with you, that's the bottom line. Because if God says I will be with you, actually nothing else matters. If God is with Moses, then Moses can't fail. No matter what his age, no matter what his qualifications, no matter what his past history is, no matter what his story is on any level. But when Moses says, I can't do this, God's answer is absolutely right. Because God's answer to Moses is, you're right. You can't do it, but I can the second excuse that Moses has, um, we find it in, again, in verse, uh, Exodus 3, verse 13. Moses tells them, well, they don't even know me anymore. I mean, it's been 40 years. And the text reads as follows. Then Moses asked God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is your name? What should I tell them? I mean... They don't remember his name. He's not been around for 40 years. Shoot, there's some people that come to church and they, they act like I'm their pastor. You know, I bumped into somebody a, about a month ago at the grocery store and they said, Pastor, so good to see you. You know, I, I miss being at church. I'm so happy to have you as my pastor. I said, I'm not your pastor. I haven't seen you in two years. What do you mean I'm your pastor? I'm not your pastor. I don't know where you're going, but... <laughs> I mean, hello, I am not your pastor, you know. And so it's the same thing here with Moses. 
He's been gone for 40 years. A whole generation has arisen that knew nothing about Moses. If they heard anything about Moses, it would have been that this is the guy that's a fugitive from the law. Not welcome to you, not wanted here. He killed an Egyptian. He hid the Egyptian's body. And then he ran off into the desert. And he didn't face the consequences that were due him for killing an Egyptian, one of Pharaoh's people. No one had seen him since. No one had seen him for 40 years. He just ran off and figured, you know, after 40 years, I hope they don't still charge me or bring up those charges. So this excuse contains kind of a kernel of truth, but it's not the same issue. The question is not, who are you? Because that's the question that Moses is asking. The question really is, who sent you? See, because Moses said, when they ask me, who are you? What am I supposed to tell them? But it doesn't matter who you are. It's who sent you. This reminds me of a story from the days when Richard Daly, um, the father, not the son, was the mayor of Chicago. In those days, you got a job through patronage or connections. You knew someone who knew someone, and you could get a job with the city. The city was very corrupt. I've been going to Chicago since, since I was a teenager, so I kind of understand a little bit about Chicago. And, you know, one day a man went to a certain office, and he was asking for a job, but no one knew him. So the question came, who sent you? And the answer came back, no one. The man in charge famous, re, famously replied, we don't want nobody, nobody sent. <laughs> And that's a good principle to remember also in spiritual matters. If you come on your own authority, we don't have time for you. And that's the way it is in spiritual things. See, God knew the people would ask Moses that certain question. So he prepared them with the answer. What did God say in Exodus 3.14? I am has sent me to you. I am is God. I am. That simple phrase contains the essential truth about who God is. I am. He's the personal. He's the eternal. He's the self-existent God of the universe. Everybody knew who I am was. He always was. He always is. And he always will be. I am God. He's above all things. He's beneath all things. He's behind all things. And he's in front of all things. By him, all things are held together. In him, all things have their being. Without him, the universe doesn't exist. Think of it this way. According to his name, he is the essence of whatever you need at the moment. When God says he's I am, I am your strength. Make it personal. I am your courage. When God says, I am, he says, I am your health. I am your hope. I am your supply. I am your defender. I am your deliverer. I am your forgiveness. I am your joy. I am your peace. I am your future. See, when God says, I am, we just look at those two little words, I and then am. I am. What does that mean? It means God is the essence of everything that you need. I am. See, that's the God of the Old Testament. God is saying to you and me, I am whatever you need whenever you need it. Whatever it is. He is the all-sufficient God. He is the all-sufficient God of every circumstance. He's the all-sufficient God of every pressure, of every pain, of every problem. He's the all-sufficient God of every crisis in our lives. Go to the elders of Israel. Tell them what I told you. They will believe you. Then go to Pharaoh. He won't cooperate. I'll work miracles. He will let you go. Plunder the Egyptians on your way out. Ask for silver. Ask for gold. They'll give it to you. In other words, don't worry about the future. 
God has a plan that covers all the details. See, most of us, we never move off the dime because we think, you know, well, I'm not going to move until I see all the green lights. That doesn't, that doesn't work with God. When God says go, even if the light's red, you go. And the light will change. The third excuse that Moses uses here is, they won't believe me. So now Moses has another what-if question. It's from Exodus 4.1. And Moses is now telling God, what if they don't believe me and will not obey me, but say, the Lord did not appear to you? I mean, that's very possible, likely, in fact. Moses had a very checkered past. I mean, he fled Egypt after he killed um, um, one of Pharaoh's own. And after being raised by Pharaoh's daughter, Moses actually rejected Egypt and everything about Egypt and chose to suffer with God's people. I mean, that seems kind of crazy in and of itself. I mean, Moses lived in Pharaoh's palace. He had every pleasure. He had every every possible benefit, every perk you could even imagine. He had the best education, the best comforts. I'm sure he was sleeping on Egyptian uh, 1,500 thread count sheets every night if they had them back then. I'm sure they did, but I'm not sure. But um, he had the best of everything, the best linen, the best luxuries, the best of everything. Um, I'm not sure if he had a Tesla or not, or a Mercedes-Benz, but he had the best of everything. But then, you know, um, he chose to suffer with God's people. He murdered the Egyptian, then he covered it up, then he did what a lot of people do when they're, when they're, when they're in a serious problem. He ran away. A lot of guys do that. You know, the pressure gets turned up, now what do I do? Run! You know, and, and, and Moses has been gone for 40 years. He's been on the run for a long time. Now he shows up saying God spoke to him in a burning bush in the desert. Huh. There's no way the Jews would believe this story. I mean, Moses talks to God in a burning bush in the desert. Here's God audibly. And then the other Jews are probably going to say, you sound a little crazy. I mean, you're a little off. Um, what kind of drugs are you using? That's the best stuff I've ever seen. I don't know what they said to him. But God knew that. So God asked Moses a question. In Exodus 4.2, God tells Moses, What is that in your hand? A staff? Moses replied, and so now we're talking about a shepherd's staff. You know, basically, the guy's 80 years old. It's a walking stick. Every shepherd had a shepherd's staff. There was nothing special about the staff that Moses had. Nothing special about his shepherd's staff. But Moses, no doubt, found the staff somewhere in the wilderness. And um, it's kind of interesting because what's a shepherd's staff going to do in a situation like this? A common piece of wood. But Moses' staff was nothing like that. I mean, it was a sort of staff that would be just found in the desert, used for a while, then thrown away. If he needed another one, he'd just find another stick. But what's the point? God will now use the ordinary to do the extraordinary. And that's what God always does. God will use ordinary to do extraordinary things. You know, he told Moses to throw the staff on the ground where it turned into a snake. I mean, imagine that. A wood stick turned into a real snake. God then told them to pick it up again and it turned back into a wooden staff. See, by the way, the hard part was probably picking it up again. It's easy to throw your staff down. But then when it was a slithering snake, God says, pick it up. What do you mean pick it up? That thing's hissing at me. And it's moving. I ain't picking that up, but he did. See, but God has answers for Moses. 
The first was the wooden staff. We see that in verses 2 through 5. Then showing that God can work miracles with ordinary objects is obvious. And then the second was the leopardous hand. We see that in verses 6 through 8, proving that God has power over the worst diseases, leprosy. The third was turning the water from the Nile into pure blood, which was a preview of the plagues which were coming to Egypt in verses 8 and 9. This was God's way of saying to Moses, I've got your back. See, Moses started to see that there was great power that was coming from God. And the interesting thing with God is this. As long as you obey, God's power will convince the people of God that God is with you. See, a lot of times people are like, well, I live this broke, busted life. And, you know, I did pray this little prayer this morning, but nothing happened. Well, you haven't pressed into God enough for God to even consider uh, making something happen in your life. I mean, you know, Moses was was truly a, a, a guy that committed his life to God. I mean, he left the palace. He left the finest of everything, you know, because of the people of God. But don't miss the original question. Moses asked God, what if? <laughs> I mean, that's the big issue here. I mean, we all want to bargain with God. You know, God, if you get me out of this fix, I mean, like the jail cell um, prayer, you know, if you get me out of this fix, um, you know, you know, I'll, I'll do this, this, and this. It was funny. Um, I was, I was uh, in a situation like that myself um, one time. I was in the Wayne County Jail, not, not visiting and not there um, uh, doing Bible studies. I, actually, I was um, uh, taken there because in the dispute I had with uh, my ex-wife, the judge ordered me jailed. And, um, you know, the judge wanted some unreasonable amount of bond and um, even unreasonable beyond reason. And so the judge threw me there because she said I was in contempt. But, um, you know, it wasn't that at all in reality. But I was in a cell with about 20 guys. And these guys, um, I think I was the only white guy. The rest of them were black guys. And these guys... They were all telling their stories, you know, blank this, blank that, blank the other. But there was a guy sitting next to me, and he's like, what are you doing here? Like, you're out of place. And I said, I'm praying. And he <laughs> says, well, how's that going to work? That's not going to do much good. You know, and my ex-wife was all crazy and whatever. And I said, well, it'll do some good if, if you truly trust God. And he said, well, that never works for me. And I said, well, have you tried praying? And he said, I'm not going to pray. and Nothing's going to change. And all these other guys were kind of making fun of my conversation with this guy next to me. You know, <laughs> the white guy's going to pray. <laughs> you know, they're all just <laughs> acting real tough and bad and big and bad or whatever. And so, you know, it was funny because I started praying, praying. Well, this was in the morning. And uh, that afternoon, um, the... Um, the 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 the, bait or the the deputy came and said, you know, I want two guys out of the cell. Mm -hmm. You know, Hostosh and this guy that was praying with me. Mm -hmm. And um, the other guys are like, well, where are you going? Well, they're going back to court. <laughs> Same day. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen. <laughs> so, um, you know, the I, I got to see the judge and the, the judge actually changed her mind and said, you know, I'm not going to keep you, um, you know, or whatever. And so then this other guy... Um, he went before the court and they said, well, I don't know how his file got sent over here because we didn't really ask for him. And um, the funny thing is, I told the guy, just keep trusting God, something will happen. So the judge let us both free. <laughs> and, um, and he's like, how did that happen? So then they had to take us back to, back to the Wayne County Jail to get our clothes because they already put us in jail clothes. And um, all these other guys are like, well, where are you guys going? We, got both, we both got released. Well, can you get us released? <laughs> it's like, you had your chance. I told you, you got to start praying. And, um, you know, nobody believed me. Everybody was making fun of me. And I told him, I know my God. I know I'm not supposed to be here. And, um, and the other guy, he wrote on my coattails 
they weren't even supposed to bring him back. And he got released too. And the other 18 guys in the cell, they were mad as hornets that they all had to spend the night. And uh, we got to go back, get our clothes, and we're, we were released at that time. So that was just a funny story about prayer because I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. And I knew what had happened that morning wasn't right or just. But God always has a way of working things out when you absolutely trust him, even when the circumstances tell you otherwise. And um, a lot of people just want to bargain with God. You know, sometimes in us, you know, it, it makes us slightly suspicious of, of, of our motives, maybe even God's motives. But um, here, Moses says, now, Lord, what if we get in trouble for, you know, speaking up? You know, and, um, you know, so he was really worried. And a lot of people worry about, you know, whether we should speak up. I mean, you know, nowadays with this cancel culture and, you know, got to be PC, politically correct or whatever. You know, you mention God, everybody gets all excited anyways. But, you know, I mean, we're supposed to stand up for God no matter what. I mean, whether whether it's popular or unpopular. I mean, it's funny because just recently, even on Facebook, um, you know, somebody was complaining about the food that we pass out just this week um, on Facebook. You know, a couple of weeks ago, people were telling me I was Pastor Judas instead of Pastor Curtis. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can say whatever you want about me. I don't care. I'm just going to keep doing the Lord's work. You're not going to scare me by calling me names. My shoulders are way bigger than that. I mean... Um, I'm not offended by what you have to say. It just speaks more of you than it does of me because you don't know me at all. And, um, you know, people say and do the weirdest things. And then another person says, said to me on, on Facebook, you know, um, well, you're a pastor, you run a church. Your opinion isn't valuable at all. You shouldn't say anything to anybody because you don't even have um, First Amendment speech rights. I said, so I'm a pastor and I don't have the right to give my own opinion? I mean... People are idiots, and um, you know they don't even know what they're talking about, but they run their mouths endlessly. But you know we all we all wonder about you know what God's motives are too. Our motives, God's motives. You know, you know if I volunteer, you know how do I get out of it if I don't like it? Um, you know the guy that was complaining about the food. You know I told him you know we bless more than a thousand families a month with tons of food, literally tons of food every single month. I said, we check our food. Just because something's close dated or might even be past dated doesn't mean it's bad. We follow um, USDA guidelines for food. And, um, you know, just like a grocery store, if there's something bad, we try to sort through it and throw away the bad stuff. We don't give intentionally people bad food. And I said, the other thing about our church is we're a pantry of choice. You take what you can want and use, um, and you don't have to take it if it's not up to your standards. And I, so I told the guy, you know, instead of complaining, join us and help us instead of complaining about what we're doing. You know, people are behind their keyboard are fast to, um, to complain and throw stones, but they don't even know what they're talking about. But, you know, we might think, well, you know, if I do what God wants me to do, you know, I'm not going to have enough time to do what I want to do. I mean, if I do what God wants me to do, you know, maybe I won't have enough money to make my own, to, to take care of myself. I mean... Moses kind of had the same problem we all have. Moses knew exactly what God wanted him to do. That's perfectly clear. Moses, you know, you're the man to lead my people out of Egypt. God made that so abundantly clear. That was the whole job description. Moses' problem wasn't his knowledge. (laughs) Moses knew exactly what God wanted. His problem wasn't his education or his family background. God had already taken care of all of that. You know, Moses' biggest problem was fear. Um, He was afraid it wouldn't work out right or it wouldn't work out at all if he did what God wanted him to do. Really, his problem was fear. And a lot of us, because of fear, we don't do anything. We're paralyzed in fear. We're stuck in fear. And um, we worry, well, something could go wrong. You know, something might not go right. You know, and like, maybe like the Pharaoh would, you know, have them thrown to the crocodiles or, you know, the, the children of Israel would laugh at him or he would end up being trapped by the Red Sea 
and only a miracle could get him out of the Red Sea. But Moses wanted assurance of the result before he took the first step. And God doesn't do that. So he's out there by the burning bush trying to say, what if the Almighty? I mean, he's actually trying to test God. <clears throat> Quite frankly, we do the same thing. We play the what if game with God. You know, are you sure? What if? I mean, that's why we hesitate to obey God. We all try to do the what if thing with the Almighty. When God calls you, it'll work out one way or the other. All your little what ifs are just so much wasted time. You're not supposed to ask God what if. You're just supposed to do it. And that's really the issue here, isn't it? I mean, as long as you're saying what if, you're not obeying God. See, when God says, do this, it was like me coming here. I didn't want to come to South Warren. South Warren was the last place on my mind. I mean, I had lived for 15 years in, in, um, in Gross Point. Then I had moved to, uh, to Sterling Heights to a nice house there. Um, you want me to come to South Warren? No, I, I'm sure you didn't, I didn't hear you right. You know, not South Warren. And um, we all say, well, come on, God, that, that, I didn't hear that right. And um, actually, if we keep saying to God, what if, you're, you're negotiating with God. And, um, you know, um, and there's a big difference. Because if you keep telling God, well, what if this happens? Or what if that happens? Or what if it doesn't work out? You know, you're not obeying, you're negotiating. And there's a big difference. To obey means to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm ready. Now you work out the details. Negotiating means saying, Lord, you work out the details and then I'll obey. See, that would be easy. If God worked it all out, then it's easy to obey. But God wants you to step forward first before all those details are worked out. See, all Moses has to do is obey and God will take care of the rest. And that's the way it is for all of us, or it should be. See, if Moses needs a miracle, he's already got one. And if the miracle isn't there, he'll get one. If he needs an answer to prayer, the answer to his prayer is already on its way. If God tells him to do something, you don't think the answer to his prayers are on his way? He'll get whatever he needs as long as he obeys God. For Moses, there's one way and there's only one issue and one issue only. And it's the same question all of us have to answer. Will I obey God? That's the only issue. Okay, there's a whole bunch more here, but we better get moving. Excuse number four, I can't do it. So in Moses, in Exodus 4.10, Moses replied to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, either in my past or recently or since you have been speaking to your servant, because my mouth and my tongue are sluggish. So now Moses is trying to say, I don't speak very well. I, I can't get the point across. Evidently, he thought God would fix his problem with his speech. You know, if I sign up for your team, will you make my words eloquent? I mean, that's the deal, right? You'll fix it all before we even move from this place, right, Lord? And then God's answer comes in the form of a question. Who placed a mouth on humans? Who made a person mute or deaf? seeing or blind. Is it not I, the Lord? This is Exodus 4.20. Um, God responding back to Moses. And God says to Moses, yes, you are inadequate because I made you that way. But your weakness is part of my plan. I mean, hello? But God promises to give Moses whatever he needs in spite of his weakness. All Moses is, all Moses is expected to do is go and speak to Pharaoh because God told him to do that and the rest is really up to God. And that leads us to excuse number five. Excuse number five is probably our, the biggest excuse all of us um, actually make. I just don't want to do it. Plain and simple. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to do it. See, in Exodus 4.13 and 14, Moses said, please, Lord, send someone else. <laughs> There's got to be somebody else, right? Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. See, God said, you're the man. And Moses is like, please, Lord, send someone else. I'm not doing it. So at last, we get to the heart of the problem. God has called Moses 
And Moses simply doesn't want to do it. No wonder God got angry. See, most of us think of God as this warm, fuzzy, cuddly, loving God. God gets mad. You know, people wonder sometimes why I get mad. You know, I think it's righteous anger. Not everybody agrees, but that's a whole other sermon for another day. Because I'm sure you guys don't want to stay till midnight. But, um, but here, you know, God's angry because Moses is unwilling to do what God asked him to do. Now, even now, God has an answer to this objection as well. If Moses can't speak, his brother Aaron will speak for him. Perhaps Moses had stage fright. You know, he can't speak in public. Or perhaps he had trouble putting his words together. Maybe he was a fast thinker, but a slow talker. But God's solution is very simple. He will tell Moses what to say. Moses will tell Aaron, and Aaron will do the public speaking. Aaron must have been quite persuasive. And Aaron also must have been a natural leader. This is Moses' brother, because he founded the Levitical priesthood at that time. Moses will be like God to him. And I think it's a workable solution, but not without problems. A few months down the road, while Moses was talking with God on Mount Sinai, Aaron would do nothing while the people built the golden calf. So this Levitical priest leader, this Levitical priest founder, I mean, Moses is off talking to God on Mount Sinai, and the people are already making idols, the golden calf. Yay! You know, leave people alone. And, you know, it was funny. Somebody told me um, online on social media this week, Pastor, I don't need no man's church. I don't need to come to church. I, I got everything I need. I mean, right on Facebook. And it's like, you can't live without church because you won't grow spiritually by yourself. You won't be fed. I mean, you like to eat every day. You need spiritual food every day. We only give spiritual food out a couple times a week. You need to be fed if you want to grow spiritually. And if you think you can do it by yourself, that's why you're in your present condition. It's not working. My life's not working and I don't need no church. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it's just sad. People just don't even see it. But think about this. I remember... Um, I remember a powerful sermon I heard um, a long time ago um, from, from Jack Wurtson. It was entitled something like, What is that in your hand? The same, it was based on this text. And um, Jack loved to remind his listeners that a wooden staff isn't very beautiful. It's just a staff used to herd sheep. But God took the thing that Moses depended on and he worked it into a miracle. I mean, just a simple wooden staff, just a simple wooden stick. And the point is, a lot of us have things in our hands and we don't even realize that those things are what God wants us to use. See, we all have gifts, we all have talents, we all have abilities, we all have handicaps of one sort or another, but we have things that God has given us. We have doubts, we have insecurities. You know, we're just clay pots in which God has poured the treasure of the gospel into. And that's always been God's plan. See, God pours his word, his will, his ways into us and expects that to change us into the people that would be pleasing to him. It's his power. It's our weakness. Paul said it exactly this way in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. He said, we have this treasure in, in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. See, the power doesn't come from us. The power comes from him. And most people don't re recognize or realize that. See, scholars tell us that jars of clay were just cheap, ordinary, everyday clay pots back then. Nothing special, nothing great. The pots of a housewife um, you know, that she might use to hold milk or soup just simple pots. They might even be used as a chamber pot, um, like a bathroom pot, <laughs> if you know what I mean, not to be too graphic. But these clay pots, they were easily cracked. They didn't last a long time. And that's what you and I are, just jars of clay, these same kind of pots. That's not just you and me, that's all of us. A pot has value if it's useful to its owner. 
If it's not worth much by itself, then it's just a, a, a cheap pot. But though it's cracked and scarred, you know, it will eventually be thrown away and replaced. The pot can hold something precious or not. But when God he says that we're those, those vessels of clay pots, our vessels contain his power, and that's what makes us special. See, when we're truly walking with God, when we're truly in alignment with his word, his will, and his ways, you know, we have his power, but we're fragile, just cheap clay pots. And when we get to the end of all of our excuses, God says to us what he said to Moses. Trust me, I can do more through you than you could ever imagine. Make yourself available to me, and I will do amazing things in your life. Before we, before we wrap up tonight, I want to give you a couple quick points of application now that we kind of get the overarching idea about Moses and all of his excuses. I want to give us a couple quick points of application, some takeaways that will be a blessing to us that we can think about. See, God has the same question for you and me. What's in your hand? What could you do? I mean, you know, when you get to heaven, God's only going to have two questions for you. What did you do with my son? And what did you do for the kingdom? Those are pretty much the only two questions God's going to ask you. He's not going to ask you uh, if you partied a lot or, you know, if you were successful or if you got a big bank account or what degrees you have or, you know, did you have a big house or did you have, you know, investments or, or big retirement? He doesn't care about anything like that. He's going to ask you two simple questions. What did you do with my son? And what did you do with my kingdom? And so um, God has the same questions that he had for Moses for us. I mean, what's in your hand? I mean, a staff may not seem like much, but when you place that staff at God's disposal, that staff can be part of a miracle. It parted the Red Sea. The same staff turned into a snake and then picked up and was turned back into a uh, the same staff. See, everyone has something in their hands. Your something won't necessarily be the same something that your neighbor has or somebody else in your family has. I mean, you know, it's funny. You might have the gift of writing. You might have a talent for singing. You might have the desire to care for people that are needy. You might have financial resources. You might have time to help other people. You might have a green thumb for gardening. You could be a painter, an architect, a teacher, a nurse, you know, or just a laborer or an administrator. You know, you may have children or grandchildren who desperately need guidance in the things of God. You know, you might be needed to uh, and have the ability to teach Sunday school or teach small children, or perhaps you can lead some kids on a mission trip, or you know, maybe uh, maybe you know how to. Do tech stuff, and, you know, that's your service. But, you know, God has places for everyone in the kingdom. You know, you could be a coach that knows how to teach kids, you know, um, how to play baseball or football. You know, you might know how to program a computer and, um, and things like that. You could be a photographer or, you know, um, no hunting skills and, you know, lead, lead kids in that for church or perhaps you know maybe you have social media skills what if you had social media skills and you could use Instagram or TikTok videos to reach the kingdom for Jesus Christ instead of all the dumb stuff they have on most TikTok videos um, but the point is this don't waste one second complaining that you can't do what someone else can do and, you know as I as I think about the list that I just made, and the list is probably 10 miles longer in my mind, you know, it's kind of funny because I could, uh, I could tell you that um, I can do almost um, none of the things that I just mentioned. I mean, I know how to preach. Some people don't agree with that either, but that's okay. But perhaps one benefit of being further along in life is knowing what I can't do, so I spend my time doing what I can do. See, God has placed something in your hands. 
What are you going to use that he's placed in your hands that you can use for his glory? Because you'll be asked that question someday. I gave you these gifts. I gave you these talents. What did you use them for, for my glory? Not for your own pleasure, not for just your own satisfaction, but how did you use what I gave you for my glory? And the second takeaway that I want you to have tonight before um, I wrap this up is God will equip you with everything you need to do his will. See, Moses is, on, is the only person in history to whom God spoke to from a burning bush. Do you realize that? The only one. I mean, that didn't happen to Abraham, David, Joshua, Nehemiah, or anyone else in the Bible. But through that burning bush, God exclusively talked to Moses. See, Moses had seen through that bush God's glory. And he said, send someone else. I mean, he's seen the presence of Almighty God. And what was Moses' response? Send someone else. No wonder God got mad at him. No wonder God was so angry with him. It's one thing to wait for confirmation. But while we wait, we ought to think and pray and read the Bible and consult with wise people who are spiritually mature in the faith. At some point, waiting by faith should be, becomes another problem because a lot of people are saying, well, I'm waiting in faith. You know what you're really doing? You're stalling by faith. You're just stalling. And that's what Moses was doing. You know, Moses was trying to throw every excuse possible to God. You know, I can't talk clearly. My voice isn't as good as somebody else's. I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm 80 years old. You know, la, 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 on and on and on. And the problem is there's a little bit of Moses in all of us. You know, don't make God angry by saying no when he calls you to do something. You know, Jerry's a good example of this. Jerry's in her 80s. And Jerry, I mean, at her age, she could say, well, you know, leave it to somebody else to do. She comes to church every week. Um, she comes to church every time the church doors are open. Um, not only does she come to church, she bakes a cake for our dinners on Sunday and Wednesday. I mean, she has little, but she does much for the kingdom because she wants to please God. I mean, at her age, she could just say, yeah, let somebody else do it. I'm in my 80s. I'm tired. I've done a lot, blah, blah, blah. You know, then she'll tell you her funny stories about... Um, her early church days, but we won't get into those. Those are cute. <laughs> she wasn't always the good church girl that you think she is, but um, I won't elaborate <laughs> tonight. <laughs> Maybe at her funeral. It'll be fun, but that's like 20 years from now. So anyways, you know, don't, don't make God angry by, by telling God no when he calls your name. See, when God calls us, the big question is, will we obey? You know, when we read it in the Word of God, will we obey it? When we see it in God's Word, when we hear it from the pulpit, will we obey? Will we discover it in our quiet time if we shut down all the noise and have a quiet time with God? When we hear it, when we hear that still small voice of God, will we obey? When a friend gives us a piece of advice, will we recognize it as a piece of advice that came from God? And will we obey? When we dare say yes to God, even if it hurts, even if it inconveniences us, or even if it means giving of something that's precious to us, like our time or our treasures. I mean, that's when miracles begin, when we put everything into the kingdom, because that's what God expects. You're not going to take it with you anyways. A lot of people do, uh, do just that, but they find out that, um, you know, they don't hook a hearse up to a U-Haul, so, you know... Um, you don't get to take it with you at all. Um, it was funny. Uh, a pastor friend of mine told me the joke about this woman. Her husband died. And her husband said, well, just in case in the next world, you know, bury me with, you know, a few hundred of a few hundred grand of mine. Um, just because in case when if I need some money down the road, you know, I, I want a few bucks, you know, spending pocket money. So, you know, the funeral was a few days off, so the lady lamented back and forth, you know, what should I do? You know, my, my, my dearest uh, husband 
uh, Phil wants me to send them off with some money, and I really don't feel comfortable putting that much cash into the into the coffin. And what if somebody digs it up and steals it, and it's not risky? So on the day of the funeral, she wrote him a check and put it in a suit pocket, <laughs> and skipped giving him any cash as a send off. <laughs> Only a few of you understood that joke. The young people didn't get it. Okay. But when we say yes to God, it's a big step forward spiritually when we can say, Lord, I'll get involved. Because most of the time, we don't want to get involved. You know, I'm still sitting over here on the sidelines. You know, we've all heard the words of God. Here I am, send me. Then and only then, miracles kick in. The answers begin to come in, and the sun begins to shine again. See, once we obey, then God is obligated to take care of us. People often ask me, Well, Pastor, I would do things for the kingdom if I was blessed for you. I wasn't always blessed. I'm blessed because God blesses me because I'm faithful. Faithful to a fault, probably faithful beyond fault. Our, um, our Especially our previous elders and board at our church, they used to yell at me all the time, you know. Um, a matter of fact, one of the elders' wives, she's passed away, since passed away, but, you know, she told me, you know, six months after we turned this church over to Curtis, we're not going to have a church. Well, that was almost 14 years ago. And uh, she said, well, he gives everything away in six months, we won't have a church. Well, she was wrong. But... As we obey God, God is obligated to take care of us. As God took care of Moses, so God will do for us. See, the world is in deep need. You don't have to look too far. The world is in crazy need. This world is getting so crazy. I mean, just a couple days ago, I mean, there was a shootout with three guys at 11 in Van Dyke at 10 o'clock in the morning at the mobile gas station. And just last night, right here at the Sunoco station, there was a shooting just before 11 o'clock, just before midnight, rather, right here at Sunoco. Mm -hmm. And then there, there was another car that was trying to run from the police, and it flipped over at 8 Mile just shortly after the shooting here. Um, there, there was a flipped over charger and another car at 8 and Van Dyke. I think it was from the same incident just a few minutes after the shooting right here at the Sunoco station. Our world needs Jesus more than anything else. And until people get Jesus in their hearts and in their minds and start living for him, it's just going to be jacked up even more. See, there's trouble everywhere. You know, God has called us to go with the good news. What other good news is there? There's no good news in the newspaper. The only good news is God's gospel. That's the good news. And if we don't give the good news to people, to change their lives, to make their lives different and better. I mean, it's just going to be worse. It's going to be way worse. Mm -hmm. But this is it. God will not let us down. God also won't let us off. And God will never let us go. So we come again to this bottom line that Moses had. When God calls, don't make excuses. You know, God doesn't want to hear your excuses. God wants your agreement to his will, to his word, and to his ways. So, may I give us grace to say this, as all of us should say, Here I am, Lord, send me. You guys willing to say that tonight? Yeah. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Raise your hand. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Send me. You guys are very vocal tonight. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Let us end with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you for the words of Moses. And thank you to know that there's humans in the Bible story, Lord, that weren't willing. But because of you, Lord, you, you changed their hearts and made things happen in a great way. Moses had objections. Moses had excuses. But Moses did great things. Moses turned out to be one of your greatest. He's listed in the, the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And so we know, Lord, that you honor him as one of the greatest in faith, even though 
uh, because of a whole bunch of circumstances, he thought he couldn't do it. But all of us can do it, Lord. We just have to have faith in you. And we have to have faith and we have to study to know your word, to know your will, to know your ways, to know the track and the course that we need to be on. Because unless we press into the things of God, unless we have a prayer life, a, a life that studies the word on a daily basis, not just coming to church, but actually studies your word uh, independent, independently of, on our own to learn and grow and develop ourselves and then be, be, be fed with the word when we come to church and, and grow spiritually. Unless we do those things, have spiritual disciplines, We'll never grow in you, and we'll never have the blessings that you offer each of us. So I pray, Lord, that we recognize that we need to be attuned to your word, attuned to your voice, attuned to your will, and attuned to your ways, that your word, your will, your ways, and your voice would actually give us the power that we need and the filling of the spirit that we need to lead us, guide us, and direct us to the path of righteousness. All things that pertain to the Godhead are in you. We acknowledge that tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.